Okay, hello everybody. I'm going to talk a little bit today about a field scale research project that we've been doing with uh, Dr. Hector Carcamo. Uh, this project is looking at managing flea beetles uh, without the use of neonics. Uh, so we're doing something a little bit different as far as the presentation style today. Um, Hector was not able to be here, but we are going to have him um, he's attending remotely, so there might be a couple of glitches along the way, but uh, just, just, just uh, bear with us and, and we'll get things figured out. So, um, a bit of an introduction to the, to the study. Um, really, the basis of it is some of the work that the PMRA and Health Canada have done on dealing with neonics. Um, so they're under, under investigation and we wanted to, to dig in and see what are the best available management practices in the event that neonics are no longer an option. Um, Hector's done quite a bit of small plot work on this. Um, so we wanted to, to take you know, the most compelling results from what his small plot research told us and test it at a field scale. So, so behind me, this is our, right, this is our, this is our trial. So I, I've, I've got uh, staked out a little pathway here you can see the treatments on either side so basically what we've done is we've taken three different seed types we've taken fully treated commercial seed with insecticide and fungicide and seeded it at a, at a normal seed rate and then we've taken fungicide treated seed only so no neonics and we've seeded that at both a normal seed rate and then a double seed rate a high seed rate so the idea there being um, that the flea beetles come in with enough pressure and there are no neonics they'll thin, thin the stand, but there'll still be enough to sort of maintain yield. Uh, and that's, that's some results that came out of Hector's small plot work. Um, the additional factor we have is half of it has been sprayed with a foliar insecticide, and the other half has not. So that's, that's the gist of the trial design. Um, and as we get into talking a little bit more about some of the, a little bit more about some of the flea beetles, um, I'm gonna defer to Hector, because he's definitely the, the expert in that department. So as I'm talking, like feel free to kind of walk down, um, check out, check out the, the trial, stay within the, the, the rows of the big flags. Um, the treatments are labeled there. Uh, once I'm done talking, I'm happy to, happy to kind of have chats with you about some, some of what we've seen. So I guess with that, uh, maybe I'll introduce Hector. Um, so I'll ask him a few questions and he's going to, I, I guess we'll have a discussion and, and he's gonna talk a little bit about flea beetles how to scout for them, how to manage damage ratings. Um, one other thing is on the Microsoft Teams site, I have a couple of files loaded up there. So it, it's um, some, some images of cotyledons. So even if you're live or if you're online, you should be able to take a look at those documents through, through your Teams account and check out what's happening there. So it's something you can kind of do as, as Hector and I talk through the damage ratings. Um, so there's, it's, it's basically seven pictures, there's a little quiz. It, it's just a good way to hone your skills at, at um, doing those damage ratings. So Hector, um, if you're ready, I'm gonna start asking you a few questions here. So first of all, Hector, can you talk a little bit about flea beetles, um, how to identify them, and why this is an important topic for, for agriculture here in southern Alberta? Thanks for uh, inviting me to, uh, to talk to people about flea beetles. I'm always happy to to uh, share what we learn about flea beetles and also to hear from people about what ideas they have or how things are going with their management uh, of flea beetles. Yeah, so flea beetles, uh, this is probably one of the most important insect pests of probably any crop in the prairies. And uh, people sometimes ask me, why do you say that? And I say, well, because even if you don't have flea beetles, you still have some some form of treatment for uh, flea beetles uh, because pretty much every canola seed that gets planted in uh, in the prairies, probably in Canada, it's, uh, it, would, it would have an insecticide uh, seed coating for it. So how do we identify flea beetles? Well, they're actually not very hard to identify if all you want to do is identify them to the, the common name of flea beetles. Uh, the ones that we have in canola are mainly uh, two or three species. There's the striped flea beetle that you would find in more humid areas of the prairies. So it used to be that if, uh, if you were living, uh, say, north of Calgary, you start to see flea beetles. And if you live further north in the more humid areas of the prairies, then most of your flea beetles would be the striped flea beetle. 
that are very, very uh, easy to distinguish from the crucifer, the black flea beetles. So this uh, flea beetles really is a, is a common name for a very large group of insects. Uh, they are uh, beetles. They belong to the uh, family that has the common name of leaf beetles. That would also include other beetles like the Colorado potato beetle, the uh, Sylvia leaf beetle. Those are all leaf beetles and flea beetles. There's quite a few species. Uh, some of them are even beneficial beetles that are used for biological control for weeds and have been introduced for weeds. But the ones we're concerned with are a group that uh, feeds on our crops like canola, obviously, but there is also another one that feeds on sugar beets. And these beetles are, are quite small. They're only about uh, three to four millimeters, um, somewhat, uh, I guess, oblong, a little bit round in the abdomen. Um, and you can very easily distinguish them from other beetles because they have very, very thick thighs, uh, we could say. The technical name is femur, so the the femur of the thigh is quite enlarged and it allows them to, uh, to jump quite high. So it's pretty easy to distinguish them. And the, uh, the crucifer flea beetle sometimes could be confused with another uh, species called the hops flea beetle, which sometimes uh, enters canola fields, but it's not very common. For the most part, you will be um, finding the crucifer flea beetle. And nowadays we seem to be having a shift in the species composition, so we're also getting more of this striped flea beetle. So identifying them is not very difficult. Uh, the damage also is uh, is quite distinctive. So you will see these uh, pit holes or uh, little depressions, discolorations on the uh, on the cotyledons and the leaves. It's also been described as a shot hole, shotgun hole appearance, which I think is quite a good term for it. So it's, there's not too many other insects that cause that kind of damage in, uh, in canola. Sometimes you will have some uh, wind or uh, physical damage from uh, little pellets of sand blasting the leaves that may look a little bit like that. But in general, uh, it's pretty easy to distinguish what you have in the field is a uh, little bit of feeding. Okay. So that's how you can identify them and how you tell the damage. Yeah. And typically in southern Alberta, um, canola seems to be the, the, the crop that's the biggest issue, or, or perhaps maybe mustard as well. Yes, to a much lesser extent. Uh, uh, canola is definitely the preferred crop, and, and both of actually all of the three canola species that we have in the prairies. Uh, we, have, we have Argentine canola, Polish canola, and then we have the, uh, the uh, mustard canola quality. Uh, most, I guess, uh, those three are uh, are brassica species, and and they are certainly uh, favored by flea beetles. If you have um, uh, yellow mustard, which is in a completely different genus, in Sinapis, uh, that one is not as uh, favored by the flea beetles. There, there have been studies showing that they, they definitely preference for the brassica crops compared to the, uh, to the yellow mustard. So any, any thoughts on um, what's your perspective on the best way to go scouting for flea beetles and how to yeah. make that, that determination on whether or not a, a producer would need to spray, apply foliar insecticide? Yes, so scouting for flea beetles is uh, really important because the uh, damage can occur and it can increase quite rapidly depending on the weather. Uh, if the weather is cool, the flea beetles will enter the field by hopping or so walking into the field, and the damage will be concentrated along the edges of the field. However, if the temperature gets warm, so uh, you may go from, uh, say, a, a day like today where you only have 12, 15 degrees, and then the flea beetles will be just hopping along the edges of the field, and then the next day it gets to 20, 25 degrees, then they will be flying into the field very quickly and dispersing kind of almost like rain, so more randomly. So scouting is uh, it's not very complicated. Uh, the recommendation is to look at uh, the seedlings as soon as they start emerging. So you, you need to really be on the ball and uh, visit the field and visit various spots of the field. 
So you need to, to look at the edge. And ideally, one should look at 10 spots along the edge and, and different places. So uh, you shouldn't just concentrate all your, your scouting in one area of the field. There is uh, quite, a, quite a bit of variability. Uh, you will find that one area of the field may have more damage than others. So it's really important to, to uh, try to go around the field and do, do a few spots along the edge, then move inside the field. And how far into the field you want to go, I guess it's up to you, but at least you want to go 50 to 100 meters inside the field to get an idea of the level of damage there. And then what you do at each spot is you look at 10 seedlings in every spot, then take a look at the uh, cotyledons. And what I like to do is to actually focus on on uh, on just one of the cotyledons at a time and, and try to decide if the damage is uh, below 25% or over 25%. Uh, it's a bit of a subjective rating and it will change uh, with, with, uh, with people. Uh, but I think overall it's not not too difficult to do and, and most people will, will be on the ballpark and be able to, to get close to the actual level of damage. Um, so you, you look at those uh, the two cotyledons in the plant and then count it in 10 seedlings and then get the average and do that uh, at various parts of the field. Uh, if the weather is cold and the damage is concentrated along the edges, and you may find that it's just the edge of the field that has about 25% damage if, if, the, uh, if, if it's at that threshold, and then you may be able to get away with just uh, managing that part of the field, just the edges. Okay, so the 25% um, damage threshold so when you're when you're rating a a plant uh, and looking for that, you know what's the percent damage? Are we talking about the percent of the surface surface area of the of the cotyledon that that is damaged? That's correct. Yes. Yeah. We should clarify that we're not we're not. It's not like pea leaf weevil where we're looking at at the uh, percentage of plants with damage. We're actually looking at the percentage of the surface area in each cotyledon. So you look you look at one plant. Then you uh, you assess you know one cotyledon and say oh this cotyledon is twenty uh, percent. Then the the second cotyledon of that plant is thirty percent. Then then you're you're at the average of the threshold there of 30, 25 percent right for that plant. And and you do that for every plant and get the overall average. So yes, we're talking about the surface area of the cotyledon, not about the proportion of plants with or without damage. Okay. So once, um, um, how, 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 so that, that would be an economic threshold and how, uh, how important is it to be accurate on that? Um, if you're at 20% or at 30% or, or maybe it's 40% by the time, you know, cause things, things do move, can move pretty fast. Um, is, is 40% too late or are you going to recover quite a bit, um, by spraying at, at, at say 40 or 50%? Yes, that's an important uh, point, and um, uh, one should always remember that there are two concepts here. One is the economic injury level, and the other one is the economic threshold. The economic injury level for flea beetles is actually 50%. So what that tells you is that, is that the plants can actually tolerate quite a bit of damage. But 25% is the economic threshold, so that is the suggested action threshold when you can take action and, and the reason why we say 25 percent is because flea beetles can invade the field very quickly and also the damage can increase rapidly with the temperature so by the time you actually get to spray the field the damage could very well be between 40 and 50 percent but you are still expected to have some economic returns even if the damage level is, uh, is over 25 percent that's a good point to remember. Yes. Okay. So, so I guess to to summarize, um, you know, if the damage levels are beyond that twenty five percent, it's probably still worth spraying. You just may not still recover that full yield piece, but the crops will will recover. That's that's correct. Yes. So twenty five percent is the uh, kind of the uh, I guess the trigger point, the level at which action should be taken. 
and uh, it's quite possible that by the time you you, you do spray that the damage will be over 25 percent because they're not going to stop eating just while you're waiting to get the sprayer ready uh, but you still are expected to, to have an economic return at that level okay can you comment in on some other um control measures uh, and this this will tie in a little bit to to some of the work that uh, that you've done with farming smarter um, as far as seeding rates and um, foliar applications etc right yes so um, are there any alternative methods that one could use to reduce the risk of libidal damage uh, people have looked at various agronomic practices and we can quickly review a few of them and and we will finish by talking about uh, seeding rates, which is one of the topics that we are researching with Farming Smarter and also uh, a very large team across the ferries uh, with Alejandro Costa Magna from the University of Manitoba and a few other people with that Canada. So flea beetles have been a problem for a long time, obviously, ever since we've been planting uh, uh, coal crops, uh, brassicacea crops, not just canola, but also uh, if you plant radishes or uh, cabbages, you will ha have the same issue. And it's also a problem, obviously, in other places, not just here. So agronomic practices for flea beetles, um, there has been some research showing that uh, seeding dates have had an effect on flea beetles. And if you have mostly the crucifer flea beetle, the, uh, the recommendation was that uh, you should plant as early as possible because the crucifer flea beetle tends to invade the fields a little bit later on. So if your canola crop is seeded very early and your crop already has uh, enough true leaves, then the crop should be no longer vulnerable to flea beetles. So that's something important that we should remind people is that it's mostly the cotyledon stage that is the most vulnerable to flea beetle damage. Once the the plants have true leaves and there is some room to do more research on exactly how many leaves the plants should have uh, before you should no longer worry about flea beetles. But in general, once the plants have more than two leaves, uh, it could be even earlier, it could be that once they, they have a full uh, single leaf, they already are, are more resistant to the flea beetle feeding. But if you have three leaves and four leaves, by that time, uh, we really recommend that people should not be spraying or worrying too much about flea beetles. So if you plant early and you have mostly crucifers, that could be one strategy. Lately in Southern Alberta, we have not been seeing that, and we have done some uh, research uh, with Farming Smarter recently, the last um, four or five years, and we have noticed that um, the earliest planted is not necessarily the the, uh, the one that will escape uh, uh, flea beetles. We, we notice that uh, sometimes even uh, planting a little bit uh, later or early didn't make a big difference. I think the reason why we don't have a clear picture anymore is because we are seeing more of the striped flea beetle in southern Alberta also. It used to be that that uh, striped flea beetle was a very, very mm. rare occurrence. You know, you, you collected a thousand flea beetles uh, 15 years ago, and you were lucky if you saw one of them. You know, you, you think, oh, look at that, it's a very rare event, a striped flea beetle. That's no longer the case. Uh, it looks like we're getting closer to 15, 20 percent of the population or the uh, um, individuals that are flea beetles are now represented by this striped flea beetle. So that seeding date effect seems to be disappearing. So uh, we can't really recommend uh, with much certainty anymore that uh, that seeding very early will help you to escape the flea beetles, and that's because this tripe beetle seems to be waking up earlier. Well, it, it always has. Uh, in the northern areas, we recommend people to, to seed late, which was not really a very good strategy to plant and all and get higher yields. But yeah. if you want to avoid flea beetles, you plant late and and now uh, the, the, the neighbors that planted early will be the ones that are, are providing the food for the flea beetles. And I think some people still get away with that in the north area where they just wait for others to plant and then kind of not plant too late, just kind of, I guess, play a bit of a waiting game and, uh, and not be the yeah. first one to see it. Uh, so that's one strategy, I guess. Uh, I, think, I think that strategy might have some uh, application in terms of trap cropping, but it's something that has a well. 
a, a trap crop may be planted at the right time, either uh, early or late, depending on uh, on what uh, what your situation is. So if the composition of the species might be uh, might be a strategy, especially in in uh, I guess in northern areas where where they do know that planting early is uh, what incurs the highest risk. Okay, well, so we've talked about uh, about seeding date and a little bit about trap cropping that I just mentioned. Uh, uh, tillage uh, was shown to have an impact also on flea beetles. There was some work done by Lloyd Dostal that showed that, uh, that flea beetles don't really like too much uh, residue on the soil. They seem to prefer areas with, uh, with more bare soil. However, uh, we all know that in southern Alberta, most of the uh, farmland now is turning into uh, some, some kind of minimum tillage or um, low tillage, and we still have issues with flea beetles. So I, I think the the uh, the benefit of, of having no till versus uh, till only is realized if you have a lot of neighbors that that uh, that have bare soil and you are the only one without uh, bare soil. It could also be just uh, a question also of uh, temperature and growth stages. Uh, if you have no till, you may have the plants uh, germinating a little bit later and growing a little bit more slowly. So the the ones with uh, that are growing in bare soil may be growing faster, and uh, it's just it's just a question of uh, of growth stages and kind of goes back to seed and date. Yeah, okay, so, let's so so is it uh, you know as as the crop grows faster, it's sort of at that susceptible stage for a shorter period of time. That's that's kind of the the gist there. That's right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And and the the uh, I guess the crop is no longer uh, in sync. I guess with the vulnerable stage of the major wave of flea beetles that are coming coming out of the wintering. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So the other other topic that we can talk is uh, seeding rates, and uh, I've heard anecdotes from uh, some of our more senior colleagues saying that before the advent of widespread chemical insecticides used as seed coatings, uh, people used to plant at just higher densities. And I've heard that this has been done in, in some parts of the Pacific Northwest in the past also. And basically what you're doing is you're planting a, a lot of seeds, and then you're allowing these the three beetles to thin your crop for you. And then the yield is not affected, I guess. Uh, it kind of makes sense. So we are testing this uh, a bit more rigorously now for the last couple of years. Uh, we have a cluster project, uh, again, led by uh, Alejandro Costamagna and Father Ruiz, Jennifer Otani, Jan Gablowski, uh, Farming Smarter is also involved with us doing the small plots. So what we uh, found the first year of the study in 2018, we had a pretty um, high population of flea beetles and we we got um, levels of damage that were something like 40 percent, if I remember correctly. And that year, the results were very clear in terms of yield. We, we noticed that uh, planting at very high rates, and we were, we were going with very very high densities for research purposes. Uh, we were going something like 12 plants per uh, per square foot, and uh, at that level, it didn't appear to be necessary to have uh, any any form of insecticide intervention, either uh, seed coatings or uh, foliar insecticide. The yield was just as high if you had high levels of uh, high numbers of plants, or if you had uh, kind of lower densities and, and had a seed coating or applied a foliar insecticide. So I think it boils down to economics in the end. I think uh, perhaps uh, planting at very high levels might not be economical, but there might be a happy medium where you plant uh, at lower densities and perhaps uh, uh, you might be able to get away with. Uh, Applying foliars instead of the uh, chemical treatments. In general, we we found in the in the past uh, we did a study from 2015 to 2017 where we were our main goal was to validate the thresholds. We were comparing the uh, neonic standard seed treatments with foliars, and the data was extremely variable. But uh, even despite the variability. I think we can say that the uh, seed treatments always uh, had the uh, had the highest yield in general. Not always. Sometimes there were, there were no differences between the the uh, seed treatments or the foliars or even the the uh, checks with no insecticide application whatsoever. 
Uh, but in, in general, when we saw a uh, statistical difference, I think uh, the, the um, plants that grew in the plot that had the seed coating uh, applied tended to have the highest yield. And uh, applying a foliar would sometimes help to mitigate the losses of uh, flea beetles, but not always. So the the foliar applications that you did apply did they did they confirm that uh, that threshold? Uh, yes, that's correct. So um, so we we uh, we had this study at uh, various places in the prairies and bitter lodge, uh, Saskatoon, southern Manitoba, and southern Alberta. And in in general, it looked like the nominal threshold that we have been applying of twenty five percent seems to be a good threshold. So I I think it's safe to recommend that yes. 25% seems to be, to be the correct uh, threshold to use. Okay, and and uh, I guess just to, just one thought too. I, I know there's been a lot of um, I, I've heard a lot about you know, a lot of flea beetle pressure this spring. Um, like how how frequently should you be checking your fields? Um, you know, on that early early seedling stage, if you want to be able to respond appropriately. You probably would have to be checking your fields uh, very very frequently. Um, I can uh, I, I, I cannot tell you exactly how frequently. I suppose if you could do it every day, that would be ideal. But yeah. I don't know if you can do it every day. But I, I would say that definitely you shouldn't do it once a week because uh, we had an experience uh, as researchers a few years ago. We had a study in Vauxhall and we uh, we checked our, our we rated our plots on a Friday. And then we went back on Monday to uh, about on, on the Friday, the uh, threshold had not been reached. It would have been like 15% or 1.5, 15%. And then we went back on Monday and the threshold was uh, over 40%, you know, just in, in, in two days. So it yep. is possible for the, uh, for the damage to increase quite dramatically. It can double in a couple of days. So I would say that uh, ideally you should be checking your, your fields uh, maybe three times a week. I, I I can't I can't say for sure what the number is, but the more frequent, the better. Yeah, yeah, no, and and uh, yeah, I think I think things can yeah things can move fast, and, and probably depends a little bit on what the conditions are. If you do get that though, a few warm days in a row, um, that's probably a signal to to keep a closer eye on on flea beetle activity. Oh yes, yeah, you can expect the worst damage to happen on uh, dry hot days. Because the uh, the uh, flea beetles will be very actively feeding and dispersing. Uh, if you have uh, wet, cold days, you will have less damage. But something to keep in mind that people have been wondering about, and I, I haven't seen any actual data to corroborate this. There is a concern that uh, flea beetles, when it's cool, they're actually closer to the ground and staying kind of hiding at the base, and they might be feeding on the more than the foliage. Uh, mm. I actually haven't seen data to support that. Uh, it's just a comment that people have made, and I, I think there are studies now happening to look at, uh, at the interaction of temperature and the behavior of the striped flea beetle. I think that seems to be the main one that seems to be concerning people. So obviously, if a flea beetle takes a bite out of a cotyledon, uh, it's not going to be as harmful as a flea beetle taking a bite out of the stem, right? If you take a if you bite and destroy the petiole and the, and the entire cotyledon is gone, then obviously you have a much more serious issue for the plant. Sure, sure, yeah. Uh, any thoughts on on having? I, I know when we when we spoke um, earlier this year and, and last year about our field trials, and and we tried to nail down any last uh, recommendations or suggestions to to producers as they keep an eye on flea beetles. Uh, yes, I guess just, just remind them that uh, that what we were talking earlier that uh, you really need to be on the ball and and uh, monitor the fields frequently. Uh, the flea beetles uh, are are going to be a problem only during the seedling stage of the crop. Uh, so it's really important to, to that you know seven to ten days when the crop is very vulnerable to to be on the ball and be monitoring the fields frequently. Well, thanks thanks for that, Hector. Um, yeah, it's uh, always when we kind of try new things on the technology side, there's, there's a few hiccups. So I hope everybody got some value out of it. 
Um, Hector and I pre-recorded a discussion on this whole topic uh, that we weren't able to share today, but we'll be putting that online later this week. So, so if you missed out on anything or you kind of want to get a deeper dive into a little bit about this project, a little bit about flea beetles, um, that would be a really good resource. I really enjoyed chatting with Hector. He, he, he sure knows a lot more than I do about flea beetles. So um, in the meantime, uh, just stay posted, stay connected to Farming Smarter. I try to tweet fairly often about progress on our trials and hopefully this fall we'll have a, a little bit more information about uh, some of the results here. So thanks so much for coming out.